Hello everyone, this is Jessica Pettit. Who do I have the pleasure of interviewing today? Well, I'm the one that has the pleasure, Jessica, of being interviewed by you. So my name is Amy Tolbert with Echo International. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. And I usually kick things off with two open-ended questions. There's no right or wrong answer. They're just ideas rolling around in my head. Are you ready for those? I am. All right. So the first one is the concept of diversity dividend. So this usually shows up in my side of things when people are like, what are the profits of doing DEI work? So thinking about investment, action, and return, what does diversity dividend mean to you? Well, if you're looking at the, the whole financial side of it, of course, we know there's quite a bit of research now that shows that companies that are more uh, diverse in terms of just population and the way in which they serve their clients, they are more innovative, uh, you know, I've been doing this work for over 30 years and we didn't have a lot of this data before. So I'm going to say in the last eight years or so, it's really cropping up on a worldwide basis, which is fantastic. But the one that I think is particularly interesting is a study that comes out of Europe that looks at if a management team has 20% or more women in the management leadership team. So you could have a hundred percent, um, female employees, but if none are in management, you're not going to get the same benefit. They're literally showing higher profits, um, greater market share, and certainly more innovation, which means, based from a corporate perspective, it's that they're getting more innovative products to market faster and beating competition, but also just straight being more innovative. I don't know why the magic number is 20%, but it seems to hold, hold true. Oh, that's really cool. It is interesting what happens now that there's actual data and assessment to back up what at least in our world has been kind of common knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of cool. All right. The other open-ended one is asterisks, other duties assigned. So what I'm noticing is, is these kind of extra things that you either get assigned by usually your supervisor because of who you are or things you take on either to build community or something like that. What does asterisk other duties assigned mean? But more importantly, how has that shown up in your work and you navigating work? Well, that's an interesting one because I think it depends on whether you're asking for the asterisk or if you're getting assigned the asterisk. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll have the token female, the token Hispanic person, the token person that speaks Hmong, that's always the one that's getting tapped. And if they're getting tapped by the organization and not getting any kind of um, compensation, and I don't mean necessarily dollars, but I mean it might be an opportunity for advancement, it might be more development, it might be um, sharing their responsibility, visibility more with upper management. I think that's a huge ask without that kind of compensation, and I use that loosely. It could even just be more true value and appreciation uh, rather than just an expectation. But in my world, of course, with um, ERGs and with working within the community, people will often step out and ask for that asterisk, and sometimes they get it, and sometimes maybe not so much. So I, I think it really, it really depends on whether or not it is an ask on my part or an expectation on the part of the company. And I think we just have to be really aware of that in terms of management and coworkers, things like that. Yeah, I agree. One of the interesting patterns that's coming out with that particular question is that there are times where the burden, I'm using air quotes, of yeah. other duties assigned is a quick route to burnout. And the opportunity is a, a way for people to do self-care, right? Which it's interesting because if you aren't connected into the actual relationship or actual conversation, then you don't necessarily know which one you're providing, using air quotes again, which one you're providing for the person. But if someone you work with makes cheesecake and really enjoys the cheesecake, then giving them the opportunity, space, time, work, value of their cheesecakes is a great way for them to showcase skills and feel good about themselves and contribute, blah, blah, blah. But um, I, always, I always worry when cheesecake quits and the news person gets the job, I seem to always, when I used to have an office job, I would be the person who then would get Cheesecake's office and I was expected to make dessert and I don't know how to bake. Right, right, absolutely. And I, you know, I'll just tag on that. I think it's 
it's a really great analogy actually because if you're looking at uh, let's say that you're this great cheesecake maker and what you really want to do though is learn how to make more savory dishes you know, you don't ever get that opportunity if people kind of peg you and label you as this is the one thing you do, which might be a gift or a skill that you've developed. But again, I think it goes back to what the development is and what the expectation is. And that's a conversation versus just, hey, isn't it great that, you know, Amy's good at this or Jessica's good at that. It's more about um, looking at what do they want to develop and do they have some other inner need or other incredible skill to bring and it's never had an opportunity to really bring you know get brought to the surface yeah and things change and evolve over time so one of the things about your own work that i'm excited to uh, listen to how you connect them but i think it shows up in this example but when we talk about unconscious bias action and responsibility if we take cheesecake um which is funny because i'm actually thinking of someone who did used to make really good cheesecakes um and he, quit. and he still makes good cheesecakes but what's interesting though is that i was working at a hospital and there was a like head nurse who really liked making ba uh, bakes uh, lots of sweets and stuff sure. and so i made a joke that when i came in i was like well i like corner brownies so make sure you bring me some corner brownies and uh oh, i'd fight you for those <laughs> There's four we can share. <laughs> um, so when I came in, there were no brownies. Well, it turned out that she was bored. So in the time of our original phone calls to when I actually showed up, she had made so many sweets that particular time period that by the time I showed up, she was bored and she felt like she had to make them. So then I was like, no, no, no you don't ever have to make sweets. It's not even in your job description. So right. then she had this break and then got to like kind of fall in love with it again. So I think similarly, when we talk about like actions, like this is what you do is that there's a, you have to be in conversation and take responsibility for the actions that you're asking, because obviously responsibility and action are deeply rooted in conscious and unconscious bias, which is segues into your work. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you do that and how that may or may not show up? Well, same as what most people are in this field, probably it was a very checkered past. Um, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I went to school in upstate New York, and I started in advertising in New York City. And so I wasn't even in this field. And my mother actually was a, a career development person, a trainer for many, many years. She was one of those women that went to work after, you know, five weeks of having her first baby back in the in the 50s. So um, I grew up in a really, I think, different kind of household. So got really burned out fast in the whole advertising world, as you can imagine, in the early 80s, and then started moving a little further west, um, went for my master's in Ohio. And I was in a project team. I, I had a joint, joint degree at that point. It was radio, TV, film, and adult learning. So I was trying to move kind of into the video world of how do you train and educate adults using a particular medium. Mm -hmm. so we got into satellite training and some very cool kinds of virtual things. Well, one of my project teams, I had this guy that completely did not think the way the rest of the team members did. He was slowing everybody down. He was making decisions differently. His process flow was different. Um, showing up for meetings was different. How you conduct yourself, how you bring up your opinions, how you elicit opinions, everything was different. And he was from originally from another country. He had only been in the States for a couple of years. So we started looking and looking into how in the world can somebody think so wrong? Like it was just, he was, we were all right, of course. And he was so right. So I was going to educate him. So I was the one that was elected to go to the professor and say, you got to get this problem guy out of our group because he's going to bring our group grade down. And of course, we're all very competitive. And he said, yeah, that's part of the learning. You go figure it out. <laughs> so it turns out that we, we really got into cross-cultural norms, understandings, um, what the continua are of various things that, like how time is managed, how relationships are managed, how decisions are made, um, how risks are either accepted or avoided. And I discovered there's this whole body of research around intercultural education, and I just got enamored with it. So I ended up coming here to finish my doctorate in international um, communications and intercultural communications. So our approach to DEI work really does take this 
standpoint of the intercultural perspective. And there are a lot of different ways to look at it, sociological, psychological, um, more community-based, socioeconomic status. But ours really is from an intercultural perspective, which is deeply rooted for decades and decades in anthropological and intercultural research. So it's, it's interesting because it taps into the way in which you think. Mm -hmm. And the unconscious bias thing, you know, everybody thinks it's the new buzzword. Well, it's been around forever. It's, it's basic neuroscience. But we're, we're learning more in the last five years in the field of neuroscience than we knew in the other 50 combined, the previous 50. So it, it's interesting to look at the various regions of the brain, how things work, when you get triggered. And we bring all of that work into our corporate work, which I think is a little bit of a different perspective than other people that, um, or other philosophies, if you will, that may come in with lists and do's and don'ts. And if you do this, you'll get this result because it's really about us. It's about the people. And you can't, you can't gauge that. You can't guess it. You got to do this. You got to have the dialogue, the conversation, and you have to get to know them at an individual level. Mm -hmm. well, it parallels a lot with my, my work around responsibility on an individual level when people often tell me like, yeah, 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 but what about these systems? What about the structures? And I'm like, I'm totally down for that conversation. And in my 20 year work experience, if yeah. we are only having that conversation, we're not doing individual work and we have to do both. So right. this is a moment for us to pay attention to what well, the language I use is being responsible for who and how we are. And sometimes it's a lot easier to like intellectually banter about systems and structures than to sit in the puddle of your own lived experience and be responsible for it. So that's what I loved about some of the approaches that you took to work. Awesome. Awesome. And, and you know, culture, organizational culture, it doesn't shift because somebody says in an ivory tower, we're going to shift our organizational culture. It shifts because of the actions and behaviors of the individuals. And, and honestly, we know that those behaviors don't change unless they change within me, the whole person. It's not me putting on a, a face or doing it one way at the, in the workplace and another way outside. It, uh, there's no way that my brain can keep up with when that is. And when I'm, when I'm stressed, which of course, we're all stressed, good stress, sometimes bad stress, but we're all operating under these time frames and these stress levels and project. And I can't be on thinking about that all the time. It has to just become a part of my behavior. So it really is about looking at behavior, looking at what you want, what you want your outcomes to be. And you can't get there without that personal responsibility piece. Yeah, I do think murals, though, are pretty effective. Just painting a mural. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's like my long-standing joke of like, how much are you going to be doing this? To <laughs> well, honestly, I thought I'd be out of this by now. I thought, you know, doing this in the in the late 80s, we were at that point in all the, you know, Fortune 50, 100, 500 companies, because they were the ones that really were putting a focus to it. And now, of course, it's driven into middle market and smaller market organizations because we're all buying for the same talent. And we said this 25 years ago. Matter of fact, it was a coined phrase, the war on talent. And now people are going, well, where's my talent? And it's like, well, we've been saying that for a little while now. So, <laughs> so if you're just kind of waking up to it, we're a little bit behind. But it doesn't mean that we can't all catch up and support each other and help each other get there. Well, that's a good segue to one of my favorite questions. Are you ready for my favorite question? Oh, a favorite, yes. Two favorites. So first one is, what have you changed your mind about lately? What if I changed my mind about lately? Oh, I had a car license plate, a vanity plate at one point that said no limits. And it was really about no limits to your thinking, to your mind, to your, but you know, we're in a human community. We're in, and, and there are limits, there are limits. <laughs> so that's one thing that I've kind of shifted around a little bit, but not necessarily in your own thinking or abilities, but in um, just being clear about maybe a good way to say it is what your boundaries are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So so before it was kind of like this Pollyanna, there are no limits. Well, yeah, there's boundaries, then there are limits. So I've, I've changed my mind on that one. That's awesome. I like the phrase, phraseology, I think is the term. Um, that you can do anything, but you cannot do everything. Yes. 
Absolutely. Okay. Second favorite question is what do you absolutely know? Oh, what do I absolutely know? I know that people are inherently good in my experience. That's all I can speak from. I know that um, anything is possible if we determine that it's a personal goal and we want to take that call to action and make those steps to get there. I kind of grew up with, again, I'll go back to my mother. She's a huge influence on my life. Um, she's 91 right now and we still talk every single day, no matter where I am in the world. And I grew up with the Dennis Waitley tapes playing, the old cassette tapes <laughs> would, would be playing wherever she was in the house or the Dale Carnegie, the little books with all the positive sayings. And so I think it just sticks with you. And I think that that positive thinking, the mindset that we have, um, when we get out of bed, we determine what kind of day we're going to have. I absolutely know that. That's awesome. Okay, are you ready for lightning round? Uh oh, this one's gonna be, you know, I've never done the game show things, but I'm gonna try like the lightning round and I'm just gonna be really open to it. Sounds great. So you pick three random numbers from my icebreaker cards. They're either easy, intermediate, or deep questions. So your first random number is number five, which is easy. And if you had to choose a celebrity to play you in a movie of your life, who would it be? Oh. Can it go back over time and anything you want to? I, I, I think it's got to be Jane Fonda because I just saw her five acts. Great, perfect. <laughs> okay, the second one you picked was number forty-seven, which is deep. Given the ability, in what one Olympic sport would you most want to compete? Oh, I think swimming. Oh, wait, wait a minute! It could be the high jump. It could be the high jump because that was something that was, and I'm going to make a link there, right? It was, I know it's lightning round. I'm not supposed to do that, but <laughs> it fundamentally was changed. Like everybody did it one way and then Fosbury kind of did the flop and switched it. So maybe it would be the high jump, come up with a new way to do it. Excellent. Okay. Last one, number 17, intermediate. When oh, in one of each. Woo. I know. It's kind of <laughs> random. Um, when and where have you experienced the most peace? Oh, on the water. Mm. I'm a water baby. I'm an Aquarian. I've been on boats my whole life. I'm, I'm just a water person. Excellent. Well, Amy, if people wanted to get in touch with you to learn more about your work, where would they go or how would they go about doing that? Well, the website has a lot of information, Echo International. Um, there's the re-release of the ostrich book at the ostrichwheel.com um, site and always email. I love conversations, um, get an email, string going, pick a, pick a day and time, connect, do this, see each other face to face. It'd be great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for doing this. Dun, dun, dun.